Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and we're going to talk about three-quarter gold crowns. You know, partial veneers have a lot of advantages. Conservation of tooth structure, accessible margins, less gingival irritation. They're more easily seated into place because they're self-venting. The cement has an escape way. We can also see if they're cemented completely. We're able to electric pulp test these in the future as well. So you can see that there are definitely plenty of advantages to using partial veneers. However, on the flip side, there are some disadvantages, one of which is they are less retentive than full gold crowns. So I think I would choose to use these for single units and short span fixed prosthesis. Some kind of a feature should probably be added to increase their retention form. The grooves are most common. The preparations are really tough to do, but let's try to make it easy today. And of course, they may be potentially unesthetic if we don't watch out. There are different types of partial veneers, three-quarter crowns, seven-eighths crowns, onlays, and pin-modified three-quarter crowns, half crowns, reverse three-quarter crowns, with grooves, without boxes, with boxes, all kinds of things, a lot of variability. We're going to stick to the standard today. But I did want to emphasize that the three-quarter crown, although it has tremendous advantages, conservation of tooth structure, etc., it doesn't have nearly enough retention in some situations, so we have to be careful about when we perform these restorations. The full gold crown is still the king of retention. When we take a look at the three-quarter crown, we have to remember that the facial surface is preserved. Maxillary preparations end at the occlusal facial line angle of the tooth, and because of this, they may be aesthetic, and the metal is not normally seen. Like I was saying before, a little less than half the retention of a full crown. When we look at this model of a three-quarter crown, you can see that it has the same features of a crown in the sense that it has a finish line, which is chamfer, functional cusp bevel, but it has some other very interesting features off to the side. Offset, occlusal facial bevel, grooves, and flares. These are all features that make this preparation a little bit challenging to perform. When we look at it from the occlusal view, you can see the functional cusp bevel and the chamfer finish line, very clear, very understandable features of every crown preparation. But it's the flares, the offset, this small bevel that we have and the grooves that can sometimes make this preparation really challenging. So let's take a look at a video of a start to finish process of performing a three quarter crown on tooth number four. And what I like to do is do a little bit of a pre-prep planning. And I'll use a little mechanical pencil here and show you that the flares dictate how we're going to perform the axial reduction. And the flare should probably come out such that you have about a 0.5 to 1 millimeter of clearance with the adjacent tooth, which is a little bit more than an amalgam. And the flares make an angle of approximately 135 degrees with the axial wall. This should help you get an idea of the planning stages of the preparation. Now another thing to keep in mind is that this, this incline here on the facial, this lingual incline of the facial cusp, is not reduced quite as much as the B plane and the A plane off on the lingual side. It's more steeply reduced. So we're going to have to kind of keep that area underprepared compared to the middle and these two areas back in here where you can see that we're going to be reducing 1.5 in those three dot areas, yet at the top we're only going to be reducing about 0.5 millimeters off that cusp tip. That provides a much more steep reduction plane on that facial cusp. I'm using a, a burr that is a carbide. This one here happens to be a 57, which measures one millimeter in diameter which is a uh, fantastic burr to use because it provides us with a very smooth finish and it also can be used as a depth cutting guide. We're going to initially cut the preparation with the uh, burr only penetrating about one millimeter into the, the tooth at the uh, central groove area, but as we move along we're going to uh, smooth it and take off the remaining uh, half millimeter to provide us with the 1.5 occlusal clearance that we need to have on the lingual side of the preparation and in the center. On the facial, the reduction will be a little less than one millimeter when we measure it. Uh, we're only going to take off about half a millimeter off the cusp tip, but that cusp tip hangs out over the mandibular tooth and, and 
you'll be able to insert an instrument uh, that measures approximately 0.75 millimeters to determine how much space you've actually created for the gold. So to make it really clear, we want 0.5 millimeters reduction off the cusp tip, 1.5 in the center, 1.5 on the functional cusp in the reduction areas. Right now I'm working on the C plane. This is the non-functional cusp plane. Now we're going to turn our attention over to the B plane, which would be the plane that is on the functional cusp that faces the non-functional cusp. And you can see how I'm using the burr uh, to determine the depth, uh, measuring the walls that are remaining after I'm prepping to see how much space there is. And the burr being one millimeter is a really great way to do this. It's uh, tricky sometimes to do this and not damage the plane you've just reduced. In other words, right here while we're taking the burr, it's pretty tricky to avoid hitting the uh, C plane that we have over there. So you have to pay attention to a couple of things, the angulation of your burr, uh, and then using this, almost this feather stroke, this brush stroke, uh, remove the tooth structure very lightly and keep in mind where the end of that burr is located at all times so that you don't end up damaging the other plane. I typically like to reduce these lingual cusps straight across, uh, not have them go uphill and downhill so much because they are fairly straight uh, bulky cusps and they don't have the, the inclination that you would have on the facial cusp. You want to be really careful that you don't end up hitting the adjacent tooth, so you leave a little bit of that proximal tooth structure unreduced so that we don't inadvertently put the burr into those areas. We can now turn our attention onto the A-plane, and we want to have 1.5 millimeters of occlusal clearance here, so we're probably going to end up reducing about the same, assuming that the typonon is uh, well equilibrated. We want to hold the burr at about a 45 degree angle, which uh, lines up quite nicely with the opposing mandibular cusps. So this functional cusp bevel is going to be angled uh, about 45 degrees relative to the horizontal and make sure you don't make it too steep or too flat in this particular step. Spend some time. This is probably the most important step uh, in terms of preserving aesthetics is to not over reduce the facial cusps and yet provide yourself with a very uh, robust restoration in the functional cusp areas. Once we've got the, the basic reduction done, we can then switch our attention over to the axial and we're going to utilize a burr, a diamond that is called a 878K012. Line it up with a line of draw. Don't tip the burr buccal lingually or mesial distally. Hold it up along the line of draw and then plant your finger rest really securely so that you make sure that you're not going to create a line of draw issue which could ultimately impact the, our ability to make this an aesthetic restoration. Uh, if we tip the burr too far to the facial while we're doing this step, we're going to have a preparation that has a inadequate retention due to an over tapered lingual wall but also it's going to tend to force us to place the flares leaning towards the facial which typically uh, provides us with a restoration that is less than optimal in the aesthetic area. So uh, the burr here is really great for for creating the proper taper. It's a little bit thick uh, to go interproximal so what I try to do is move the burr up and down into this area very carefully, trying to minimize the times that I hit the adjacent tooth. Uh, it does happen from time to time very minimally, and we'll show you at the end how I repair those little nicks that you may occur. Just painting the burr around, not really worrying too much about the finish line uh, form. We're going to be working on making a really beautiful chamfer with a different burr in a much later step in the process. So just keep this uh, relatively straight up and down, allow the taper of the burr to do the job for you. You can see that we've taken the burr pretty far in approximately, but definitely not to the point where we can break contact. For this purpose, we're gonna need to switch gears and move into a much skinnier burr. 
I like to take the pencil again, at least when we're teaching, or maybe this is one of your first three-quarter crowns you're doing on a type and on, and go, and go ahead and uh, paint the uh, the flares in there. Uh, mark them with a mechanical pencil. Uh, some people like to teach from the center of the tooth, it comes straight out in one angle. Uh, I don't think that's a bad uh, idea. It's a little bit off what the uh, the flare angle of 135 should be, but it's close. And you can see that the flare should clear the adjacent tooth and touch that corner of the molar and touch the corner of the premolar uh, at the at that curvature of the of the line angle. It should be just touching those areas, almost like a tangent, a line touching a circle. So here we have this incredibly small burr, the needle burr, 859.010, which means that it's one millimeter wide at the top, at its widest point, but the tip is uh, much, much smaller, uh, closer to one half millimeter. And by using the burr in a kind of a stepwise manner, moving it up and down the side of the interproximal and not trying to plow it through at its full length, we can usually minimize the damage that we would create on the axial wall that we're preparing and also uh, the adjacent tooth. You can see here that I even have a little shell of tooth protecting the molar adjacent while we're trying to push this through and break contact. We're only concerned about breaking contact this, at this point. It's, it's not a burr that would ever provide us with the margin that we want to have, our finish line. It's not a burr that is easy to use because it's so long and tends to be a little unstable, but it's really uh, unbeatable when it comes to breaking proximal contact. So we'd highly recommend that this burr be utilized for this purpose. So it's good to take a look at this from the occlusal and see how things are going. Our flares are in the right place. A little bit underextended on the um, distal, particularly, and a little bit on the mesial. And you can see that I've created a couple of small nicks in the adjacent teeth, which I uh, would like to avoid at all costs, but uh, they happen sometimes, particularly when I'm trying to videotape uh, with the camera hanging above me. It's hard to uh, get my... Um, proper chair position, etc. So I do the best I can. So let's use this burr kind of in a chopping down motion from the occlusal down to the gingival. And uh, you can see we're just kind of uh, taking little pieces away, like little steps going down, down, down until the burr gets all the way down to the gingival. At first you may think, wow, that's a lot of uh, clearance of the adjacent tooth. That won't be aesthetic, but that's not true at all. Uh, these, these, uh, preparations are hidden by the adjacent teeth. They don't show. They tend to be uh, quite aesthetic if they're performed properly. So we've cleaned it up a little bit and uh, we've got essentially the taper uh, pretty close. Uh, the margin of course of the gingival is not done uh, and you know usually at this point I like to go back to the 878k to renegotiate all those areas that I just prepared with the needle shape burr. Get the taper a little bit more evened out uh, because this burr is so much easier to control. The burr is uh, excellent at providing us with a very small little chamfer margin and also a um, ideally tapered preparation. Once you are lined your burr up properly, it's critical to hold the burr parallel to the line of draw. It's uh, one of those things that is difficult to do if you're uh, having difficulty with access and, and visualizing the preparation, but you want to try to keep your fin finger rest uh, even uh, or steady throughout the whole process so that the burr will be evenly tapered throughout. So turn your wrist into a milling machine and allow the, the burr to uh, go along for the ride. Uh, you know where to go, you just move uh, the burr accordingly by keeping your finger rest in position at all time. It tends to make things go a lot, a bit, a lot easier for you. So you can see that the taper now is getting more uniform. It's not bad. There are some areas on the distal that aren't quite uniform. But look at the way that we've uh, broken contact here on the facial and then uh, mesial facial and distal facial. Very nice and smooth as that occurs. So 
the the grooves once again I'm using the pencil and this is to demonstrate the location of what we call the triangle of success so we follow the flare in towards the tooth and then we cut back in a right angle like this to the axial wall and that little dot in the middle that little triangle is about the size of the of a 169 L burr which is what we're going to use to create the grooves so uh, once again you want to hold the burr in the long axis of the preparation and so we want to make sure that we aren't tipping the burr too far mesial distal or buccolingually and we want to line the burr up nice and even uh, take a deep breath and get things lined up grooves are not supposed to be like uh, example A where they're kind of rounded we want to create a little bit of a wall like B B is a little bit acute but it's pretty close like A here is showing you a much better groove so we do want to create this little right angle between the groove and the axial wall and, and avoid doing B, C, and D. So we're going to take this uh, 169L and chop it down. Notice how we're starting at the top and we're working our way down. So we want to sink the burr into the axial to the full depth of the tip of the 169L burr. But we want to keep the burr not on the, uh, we don't want to take it all the way down to the finish line. We want to keep the burr about a half a millimeter above the finish line. It seems to make a big difference when it comes to these uh, preparations. You don't want to have a butt joint margin down there. So keep it up and above. When you're trying to create the groove on the distal, we want to line up the groove on the mesial and pick up our uh, burr and move it over to the distal, maintaining our finger rest at all times, and you'll have a much easier time getting the grooves to line up properly. It is not easy, but it gets easier with practice, and we would recommend that you try this uh, on uh, the bench top before you move into a mannequin system. So the grooves are positioned. Uh, we may have little bumps in the flares between the groove and the uh, the previous flare and I like to smooth those off so that they come out at a straight edge there a straight angle and that's what we've just done on the mesial and the distal there's a little bit still left and we're going to take that little bump out right now so that this uh, has a straight wall flaring out from the internal portion of the groove you can see now that the grooves are looking pretty good there's there's even better now after I made a few modifications and the draw is looking a lot better too. I'm using a dry erase pen right now to uh, place some blue or excuse me green colored pen marks on the the lingual incline of the facial cusp and we're going to use the 169L burr to create the offset and the offset is going to be about a millimeter and a half wide and 0.5 millimeters deep but you notice it does not uh, take away any of the cusp tip areas. We're only trying to provide additional bulk for the gold so that the thin uh, area of the margin would not be likely to flex as much. This is sort of a, a reinforcement, a hidden reinforcement of the gold in that particular area. So we want to follow the, the inclines of the cusp up on one side and then down on the other so that it looks like a little chevron shape and it works like this. Let's take a look at a diagram of the side view of this so you can see a little bit better. There it is, 1.5, and that's that little check mark we do for that. So here we are uh, trying to avoid hitting the cuss tip and yet still trying to make the, the offset very distinct and uh, serving a purpose of providing more resistance to the restoration from flexure because of the fact that we've reduced it so minimally. At this point, if you wanted to use the 169L to take off uh, some of the sharp edges that you have uh, made by uh, prepping through the interproximal, you can certainly do that and remove those little edges. I like to sort of take my functional cusp bevel back to the center of the tooth. Uh, I think it takes off those sharp edges and, and makes it uh, look better but also easier for lab work to be performed. It tends to work out pretty well for the laboratory technicians when you take off those sharp little edges right there. So there you have uh, the offset placed in the grooves. Now I've taken a blue pen and I've placed it over the sharp edge of the occlusal buckle line angle area 
and we're going to utilize a burr called a 7201 and place a very small contra bevel or occlusal buckle bevel running along that little blue line there, that sharp edge. I'm using the, the colored pens because it helps you see uh, these features. And if you wanted to, you could do it yourself uh, as you practice to uh, make sure that these are of the right uh, form. As you prep, you can see the blue disappears and we have a very clear idea of the thickness of that particular occlusal buckle bevel. You can see that you're going to run the burr basically just uh, parallel to the, to the floor, parallel to the occlusal plane, and create that uh, little feature. If we need to make it a little bit deeper, because uh, we can take this up to you know, 0.3 millimeters, you can even go more if you wanted to, but you risk having the gold show, because remember the gold is going to cover that bevel that you're placing, so it could end up being a little bit lacking in aesthetics if you were to overdo it. And then I'm just using the burr to maybe remove little sharp edges here and there. You can see that the offset and the occlusal buckle bevel have been placed and the preparation is nearly completed. I am going to utilize the 8877009 in my slow speed or you could use an electric hand piece, probably 10,000 or 5,000 RPMs, even less than 5,000 RPMs if you like, and utilize the burr. Uh, to create the chamfer and we like the the tip of the burr to be suspended beyond the finish line. In other words, don't dig the tip into the finish line. Allow the side of the burr to prepare the walls and allow the tip of this diamond to hang below the finish line. That will allow you to have a very clean, crisp finish line of the preparation rather than having a wiggly one. You also notice that we're trying to keep the preparation super gingival, probably mm, I'd say about a millimeter super gingival, uh, and if you have long enough walls, it's great to do. Now I'm kind of slowing down the, uh, the motion here, so you can see that it's a very steady flowing motion. We're allowing the edge of the burr to be cutting the chamfer, and the tip of the burr to be hanging off the edge. This will create us uh, a very, very clean, smooth chamfer finish line all the way through. So let's take a look at uh, what happens uh, when we evaluate the preparation from the occlusal. We can see that uh, everything looks like it's in pretty good shape and uh, the draw is adequate. You also see that the offset is nice and uniform. It has a definite uh, form to it that you can see very easily and then there's the, the little contra bubble off to the facial. Well how does this look in occlusion? Let's go ahead and take the type on and let's close it together. It actually looks like a tooth doesn't it? It doesn't look like a prep. Now we can hold it up in occlusion and we obviously want the 1.5 in the lingual but we want to have about 0.75 millimeters maybe to 1 millimeter of clearance on the facial. And I've got an instrument called an RGS2 and this is 0.75 millimeters in diameter and you can measure the clearance really easily with this instrument. The RGS uh, instruments are terrific for that. Uh, here we see the uh, finishing of the nick that I did on the adjacent tooth. Uh, this was uh, the little areas that I nicked uh, while we were prepping. I'm using a small disc, a little uh, 3M thin uh, soft flex disc. The, uh, the fine discs work really great and I can use that very quickly to remove any little nicks that I have created on the adjacent teeth. We can also use the disc to smooth off the flare. Works great for that and we can use that uh, quite easily on both mesial and distal. And then if you have little scratches or things you can take them off with this particular uh, disc. So you can see the final preparation uh, pretty straightforward. With practice, you can get these done uh, rather quickly. They're nice to do, uh, rarely done in practice today, but I think that they're uh, worth uh, learning. Thanks a lot for watching the video. You guys take care.